Welcome back to another edition of Coexist. This is Conversation for Conservation, and I am to the moon right now. I'm to the moon because I am so happy to have one of my favorite people on the planet back on with me on this podcast and on Facebook Live, Sangeeta Iyer. And I, it's kind of funny, Sangeeta, I'm so glad to see you. You look great. I know you've not been feeling all that well, so thank you for rallying to do this podcast with me and let's share all the good news that's going on with you and with all your projects. You know, when you, when you see Sangeeta Iyer, there's like a, about two pages worth of accomplishments that this woman has done. Broadcast journalist, writer, biologist, documentary filmmaker, massive wildlife conservationist. She's world renowned. She's the founder of Voices for Asian Elephant Society. She was born in Kerala, India. I mean, everybody, when I say her name, anybody in the world of conservation goes, I love Sangeeta. We all love this woman for her passion, for her determination, for seeing something bad in the world and saying, I'm going to do something about it. And so much has happened. And let me go back a little bit, Sangeeta. I first met you when I was hosting your documentary, Gods and Shackles, back in 2016, I believe. And it was the most powerful film. I just remember, I just, I was like, I couldn't even move. I was kind of paralyzed by what I was seeing. It was so powerful. It was so well done. It's a, a, a big award winner. You've won so many awards for that movie. You've won the highest award in India for women making a difference. I, I'd like to say I can pronounce this. Nari Shakti Puraskar. Is that how you say it? You did it. Bingo. <laughs> you think I was from Kerala, India. Um, and your accomplishments and achievements just are amazing. But the thing that's really so beautiful about you is, is your humility, your focus on your work, um, that you know that you've got a big job in front of you, but you don't shy away from it. You're not fearful. You just go head in and do the best you can. So you had this amazing documentary out there. You started this amazing foundation. And since we last spoke, a lot of stuff has really transpired. You know, a lot of things have gone on. What's going on in India right now? Because Gods and Shackles was a movie that focused on the abuse going on with the temple elephants in Kerala. This is her hometown. And starting in 2013, she started documenting all the stuff she was seeing of these animals abused under religious, you know, purposes for religious events and stuff like that. So what's going on in India? I know in recent days, we've been shocked to learn that the forest department is planning to legalizing transfer of elephants. And you've written a strong letter to uh, the forest department. What, what's going on there? Where do we stand with this issue? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm just so happy to see you. And I just want you to know that I love you, too. And I just want you to know you're such a beautiful spirit. We are kindred spirits. And there is no time in this industry to, you know, have someone stroke your ego. And you're exactly the same. I don't do this to get, you know, kudos because kudos only creates jealousy. So I'd rather be just just focused on doing my task. So I just want to address that and let you know how much I appreciate you as well. Thank you. Of course. And you're, and it was so wonderful to meet you in San Diego where we had the screening hosted by Debbie Dini. And so what is happening right now is that there is a, um, you know, India has been implementing the same Wildlife Protection Act 1972. I mean, 50 years have gone by, five decades have gone by, and, you know, there's been no um, update, no increase or no improvement, uh, especially when the population in India has grown so dramatically. It's, it's exploded. Very, it's yeah. exploded. Exactly. 1.41 uh, billion, almost very close to that much. So, so things have changed when it comes to the human, you know, development I would say reckless development, right? To accommodate these people, to sustain all of the people 
that are constantly being born. Every second babies are popping out. If you take a look, at, I don't mean to sound um, crude or anything, but when you take a look at the worldometer, you'll see it's ticking every second. And yet the death rate is really low because of medical advancements. And this is great. You know, people want to live a long life, healthy life. But what is happening is that when there's so many people, you know, just try to imagine this. India is three times smaller than the United States, and it has three times more people than the United States. So they're trying to live in, everyone is like cramming for space. Meantime, India also has the largest number of Asian elephant population, which is astounding. Out of the 40,000 plus uh, Asian elephants around the world, almost 30,000 of them are in India. So how does this happen? And what is happening is that humans are now beginning to encroach into their habitat and decimating, extracting resources. And again, as I mentioned, reckless development, railways cutting through the forest, highways cutting through the forest. So elephants are now living in small forest patches. And if they are not able to assimilate and move to their migratory species, and if they are not able to move, then there's going to be inbreeding and that's going to result in so many complications and the ultimate demise of the entire species. This yeah. is important for people to understand. This is important for, you know, the government who makes these decisions to understand. But apparently there's a significant dearth of information and they were rushing to amend and apparently upgrade these, um, you know, the Wildlife Protection Act from 1972. But instead, we caught it like in time, just in time. They, they were pushing this bill through and somebody noticed it about a month around the Jan around January the 31st, somebody sent me a message saying, we all have to write a strong letter. Of course, I project, um, you know, I presented so many images from still shots from my film, Gods and Shackles, and I wrote a 24 page strong report. And I said, this can't happen. And I actually sent it directly to the chairman of the standing committee, who's going to now look at it and he, he was blown away by all the responses. And he personally responded to me. And I was just really honored to receive his message saying, don't worry, we are reviewing the, everything and we are going to, you know, take meticulous steps. And then I was even more excited to see. I mean, yeah, let's stop right there. That's enormous that you got a document in front of the eyeballs of somebody who actually has power and can do something that it went directly like a direct highway to him. Shocking to me. So that's a, right there. That's a huge victory, just that he's even taking it into consideration and hearing what you're trying to say. Well, thank you. I, I'm yeah. That that is so important. I I really appreciate you stopping me because yeah. I just go 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 go, and I don't think of oh, this is a big deal. Well, but it's like you said, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And oh, you're making me emotional and all. But um, but now, so I've sent it to him, and he um, he tweeted just a couple of days back, and he said. The, amend the proposed amendment bill was completely out of whack. It was so poorly thought out. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so Under the wire. Under yeah. the wire. You swoop in. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love this. <laughs> and and I want to I backtrack on something you said about encroachment. Because imagine with the population of India, and you, were, you set up a very good example of the size of the country versus the U.S. and the population difference where we have, you know, like 330 million or something, and you're at 1.4 billion. So we are having the same issue in Zambia because people have decided, hey, we're going to encroach and go right up against a national park. Hey, we're going to raise cattle here. Nobody thinking about the implications of that. And we're having to work with Senior Chief Nasefu saying, whoa, you got to you got to back the villagers out of here. Here's why um, some of your people will be killed in this area because animals react to stress. Um, 
you know, what happens when lions start coming after your cattle, you know, it never, it's just bad in every sense of the word. So encroachment is a big issue when you're dealing with animal populations and the impact on their population and on humans. So you really have to think it past like three steps. It's like 30 steps. Okay. If this happens, what will happen on the other side of that equation? So go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you and, and that's exactly what is happening. Agriculture, that's another issue, like you said, right? And, you know, one of the things that happened uh, in 2020, when I was filming for the National Geographic series is that I did film cattle inside the forest, happily grazing away. The problem is not only that they're you know, engulfing all of the food that belongs to the elephants, but also the cattle, you know, dogs and all these domestic animals, they carry different kinds of viruses and bacteria. So zoonotic diseases, they're going to carry. And another thing is like tuberculosis is common in India and tuberculosis is a zoonotic disease. When people and cattle and all these different you know, domesticated animals, they venture into the forest, they are carrying with them, with them, all these viruses, and they could transmit those diseases to elephants and other wildlife, potentially impacting them and, you know, destroying their health and their well being. So that is yet another significant issue, not just the encroachment of animals and wildlife eating the cattle, they will automatically do that. But the spread of zoonotic diseases yeah. and COVID should have yeah. been a wake up call for all of us. Thank you. Thank right? you. I mean, we, we've been in a shutdown globally for two years now. Um, imagine that happens in wildlife populations. You introduce something foreign and all hell breaks loose. You know what I mean? You just don't even realize what it can do. It can completely wipe out species because they're vulnerable to a certain virus or a bacteria. And these are really, really valid points. So I'm really glad that you brought that point up as well. Yeah, thank you. And the COVID situation has not only, uh, I hope it has really taught people some lessons, or should I say, I hope people have really learned from this, you know, the two years of captivity. You know what I mean? Like we are cooped up inside our homes and you know, we're getting frustrated and depressed. And yet, when we do the same thing to animals and bring them into captivity, at least think of what, you know, intelligent, highly intelligent and social animals like elephants, what they would be going through, right? Yeah. So, so, and then, you know, they, when human elephant conflict happens, as you would know, of mm -hmm. course, animals are the bad guys. So they will dart and capture them and use that as an excuse and exploit them in all kinds of, you know, stuff like cultural festivals behind the veil of religion or in zoos behind the veil of education or circuses, you know, thinking, oh, this is the greatest kind of entertainment for human beings. Yet, you know, we have so many technological um, advancements, but we are not evolving consciously. True. That's a true statement. And and what we're doing is if you're going to take it, take it, maybe people understand it in a selfish way. What they're not understanding is if we don't start understanding how the, the dots connect, all we're doing is setting ourselves up for failure. Because as you've seen what COVID can do, um, they're saying the next pandemic could come out of factory farming. I'm surprised it hasn't already. Um, if you don't think wildlife and animals are connected to your health and your future, you have missed something really serious in school. You really did. You must have called in sick that day in class because there is such a strong connection. Absolutely. And many people believe in COVID uh, out of the Wuhan labs spread through the uh, wet markets in yeah. Asia, which a lot of stuff spreads in the wet markets because of the most filthy, vile, disgusting places on the planet. So you have to be aware um, when you try to uh, outsmart Mother Nature, she's going to open up a can of you know what on you. And uh, she's got the power to do it. And this is why we have to really think things through 
long term and where it's all going to go and how it's all going to end. So now you've got a 26 part short documentary series that premiered on Nat Geo recently. So, you know, not like you aren't the busiest woman in the universe writing books, which we're going to get to your book here, you know, creating documentaries, you know, being a journalist, scientist and everything that you do every day. What made you do this um, series for Nat Geo? Tell us about it. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, it, it was a it was a very, very humbling and, you know, humbling opportunity. I still remember I was waiting um, inside a plane, um, you know, a tr getting a transit from Texas to um, get to Toronto just after we finished screening Gods and Shackles uh, in 2018, November 2018. And I'm kind of looking over my emails on my phone and all of a sudden I have this message from Nat Geo and I'm saying oh yeah whatever and I opened it and it said congratulations you have been nominated as our you know the Nat Geo Explorer and uh, we are giving you this award and so storytelling this is National award. Geographic I mean this is like the 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 ultimate of ultimate in the world of conservation I mean come on seriously I would be screaming yeah. Well, I would thank you. I was so honored and I was humbled. And I, I did I did the screaming thing inside the plane. And the person who was sitting right next to me. She's like, is everything OK? Like, I actually didn't scream, scream, but I started crying. Right. Oh, and I'm, an, I'm an emotional, crazy person. But uh -huh. she sat right next to me and she's like, are you OK? And I'm like, yeah, look at this. You have no idea how OK I am. I'm so OK. I'm crying. Oh, my God. You kind of remind me of me a little bit. I think that's why we're like friends. It's like. We're so similar in so many ways, like the way we look at the world, like the yeah. way we go after problems. And, yeah. you know, it's funny. I was thinking today when I was getting ready to come here and I was thinking about since, you know, Victory and I founded, co-founded our foundation in 2015, all of a sudden I was thrust into the world of people in conservation and wildlife work and da, 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 da. There's something about meeting another person in conservation that makes you a deeper friend faster because you have such big common ground yeah. together. You know what I mean? It's like you meet people like, oh, they're really nice and stuff like that, but you don't have a deep connection with them. But everybody I've met in this industry, there's just this soul connect. You recognize it in each other. Like, I so understand where you're coming from and what you're doing because, you know, I feel it too. It's really interesting. It's the most giving, open, dedicated group of people. I I feel like I'm walking amongst giants and like I was let in the back door somehow and got into this thing. I feel so lucky that I snuck in, but I've got to I got to meet all these amazing people, yourself included. You inspire people, you make people think, um, you make people say, you know what, I'm not gonna think about it. I'm going to do something about it. There's something I see that there's a problem with, an issue. I'm going to do something about it because if these people can do it, I can too. And that's why I started this podcast to inspire people and let them hear from the greats, learn their mistakes, learn their victories so they can get out there and, and hit the ground running faster and harder. You know, let us make the mistakes because we've been finding our way. Just learn from us so we can move faster. Yeah, absolutely. And I really love what you said about, you know, how you feel when you meet people from the same background. It's because we serve a common purpose. And that common purpose is so selfless. And we are detached from anything. I personally don't want anything in return. Like, sometimes when they give me all these accolades, I'm like, I don't even want anything because it only stokes jealousy. Just let me do my job. I don't want yeah. any recognition. Let me do my job. And with National Geographic, when that happened, they gave me the award. I said, I'm going to produce a 26 part short docu-series. It's called Project, it's called Asian Elephants 101. And the reason I produced, you asked me the question, why yeah. did you do it? Um, the reason I produced this is because when I did, when I produced Gods and Shackles documentary, I focused so much on captive elephants, the problems that captive elephants are facing. Then I realized wild elephants are facing greater problems and I needed to shed light on that. And so I have another good news to share with you. Please. PETA is considering just screening all of my films 
um, through there, millions of millions, uh, yeah, millions of, of people followers. in India as well as in the United States. And then there's I'm also um, coordinating with FIAPO, which is the Federation of Indian Animals protection organizations so there's like it's an alliance of all of the organizations come together they screen gods and shackles just um the end of january and now they're saying okay what next can we do to collaborate i said take all my films share educate yeah, yeah. that's all i want you want yeah. you to do. like i don't want anything just take it and Good. educate people right so that's happening and one of the things i'm learning uh ko is that the more we collaborate, the better it is for all wildlife. I have also noticed, I must confess, even within the uh, conservation organizations, there's this bickering and competition that oh goes Oh my on. God, I'm so glad you went there. I'm so glad you went there. <laughs> because seriously, it's like, yeah. what, are you, what are you competing against? Thank Who you. are you competing against? Like, we are in this together. Yeah, it, I said the same thing. Aren't we on the same team? When I first started this, I remember a wildlife crime expert said, Co, I applaud what you're doing, but I want to warn you. It is a very clicky yeah. field. Yeah. And I'm like, but, but I was naive, I guess. I'm like, well, why? I thought we were all going to be on the same team. He goes, Co, it's all about donor money. And they will protect that donor money with their lives. And boy, howdy, has that <laughs> been true. And so so what Vic and I said is for everybody who says, oh, no, we don't share information. And because <laughs> I have I have access to a supercomputer where mm -hmm. somebody can actually, if you give them their data, they will run data for you and find, you know, predicting poaching patterns and can show you when poaching is going to happen for free. This is a $2 million program and I can get somebody's pro data for free. And they're like, oh, no, we, we don't share information. I said, I'll never forget it. I won't I won't say who it was with yeah. but one of the biggest That's names in conservation. And I said, here's what I'm going to do. Any data that we gather. I'll just share with you, use it as you want, but I will share everything. We are wow. completely open. You need data on biofencing, poaching incidents, you know, yada, yada. You just ask, yeah. get it right over to you. I, wow. I'm so what glad you brought that up. Tragedy. I mean, that is tragic, you know? Yes. And yes. we do the same thing. All of our projects are on our website. It's yeah. like in plain sight. Yeah. You want to take it? Just take it and use it. Make it your project. Own it. In fact, we want you to own it. Yeah. Because not one individual or one organization can do it all. Thank you. Can. You yeah. just can't. Yeah, I agree. And so I'm so glad you said that because it really, that's why I, I was a, a guest on another podcast of my friends. And I said, it's very important that you know who you are making donations to. Yeah. Really see what they're doing and where their money's going. Yeah. I do not want to be hit with five calendars from the same organization in one yeah. year. I can only use one calendar. Uh, yeah. I wish I had your marketing budget because then I would have Africa pretty much dialed in on poaching with yeah. just your budget. Yeah. So make sure like organizations like Sangita's or Nasefu Wildlife, you can see exactly where the dollar goes and exactly. how impactful that dollar is. Yeah. Are there salaries? I'm like, are there fat cats being paid these crazy salaries? Nope, not at Nasefu. None of us, none of us take a salary. Only our team over there gets paid. That's yeah. it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. That's like it. what we're doing. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's like, if you, if you like, if you cannot present your financial statements, then there's a problem with what yep. you're doing. Yep. You know, that means yep. you're, if, if there's something confidential about it and, and you're using public funding, then it needs to be public information. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So good for you. So, um, so, so the, the uh, Nat Geo special, the documentary is on now. Can you see it on Nat Geo? Yes. Okay. So yeah, thanks for bringing me back on oh, track. Sure. So basically it launched on the World Elephant Day, which is August the 21st. And they have world premiered uh, nine out of the 26 uh, part, part series. But the balance, they are kind of not airing at this point. We are going to air it. And I'm also co um, collaborating with another two, two streaming companies have approached me. At the end of the day, it's the 
greatest reach that we are concerned about, right? The mm -hmm. Education mm -hmm. and it's free streaming, free for everybody. So as soon as I have more information about how it's going to be streamed, I'll share with you and I'll put it on my Facebook page and everything. Yeah. But for now, they can definitely watch nine at least or 10. One of them is on our website, uh, which is um, elephantmatrix.com. That is my personal uh, website where I post the videos and the books and everything. And then of course, my nonprofit is VF aes.org mm -hmm. which is where people can see what projects we're doing what work we're doing and stuff like that now the the documentary focuses on what exactly what part is it the wild elephants or is it part temple elephants or just all the wild elephant issues so yeah so it's so i have out of the 26 i have about 20 or 19 of them that are entirely wild elephants. okay but mm -hmm. i also have captive elephants now what i did was i and all these are short films, just six mm -hmm. to seven minutes long, because people have, you know, sure. little attention span, yeah. you know, like me. Like me. <laughs> well, me too. I'm a gnat. Attention span of a gnat. Because we have so much happening in our yeah. lives, right? And so I wanted to make sure. And and on Facebook, like nobody's going to sit and watch a ninety-minute documentary on Facebook unless you're in captivity, as yeah. we are right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, so they are six to seven minutes long. They focus on numerous things, like how many elephants are getting killed on train tracks. I, I, you know, I wish we had had a chance to talk about this. I would have screened one documentary through you right now. I would yeah. have done it. Um, train tracks and electrocution. Like, insane. this is insane to me, yeah. but you have to remember. Yeah. Because of the population explosion, you see all these wires hanging off of one pole and there's like 82,000. So animals are jumping on the on the wires, getting electrocuted. Wires fall, electrocuting. It just you're like, really, really? Yeah. You can't come up with a better electrical system than this? Apparently not. No, but and not only that, they're also installing illegal electrical fences yes. around their agricultural plot of land and their agriculture and their uh, cropland is so close to the forest that when elephants step out, the first thing they see is a cropland. So they're like, ooh, this is delicious food. I'm going to come and eat. And they just don't even see that there's like the fencing. And they, they, they're they supposed to have like, you know, alternate current flowing, but they have direct current that zaps and kills them in an instant. And yeah. this is illegal in India, but they still do it. And when they do it, there's no enforcement. Nobody is charged. And if they are charged, they're kind of left left yeah. off with like a slap on their wrist. So it's it's just a very tricky situation. Plus, you know, when you have like mobs of people attacking the forest officers who are trying to, you know, sort of enforce these laws, what are they going to do? Yeah. Right. So there's a yeah. little bit of dread and fear as well. It's a very difficult situation in India when I and because I've been on the ground and seen this happen. I can explain that this is not as easy as what we think it is in, in resolving because there's this layer after layer after layer of. But I find know. I find money, though, um, Sangeeta, sometimes money really does work when you sit yeah. there and say, hey, if you know of an illegal fencing area of crops, there is an X amount award uh, for reporting it. And if we find out it's true. Uh, you can get an award and that's the way you can kind of cut through the clutter. I love that because idea. We've, yeah, because we at Nasefu, we have an, an intel operation. And so we get the scoop on, hey, this is how we found out about the illegal cattle. We found an illegal uh, logging um, situation going on. And, it, you know, there's big deforestation going on in Zambia. So people are like, hey, we want you to know that down the road, so you have an intel thing and we have paid informers. We verify if there's something real here, legit, and we take action. We work side by side with DNPW. So you might want to introduce that. And yeah. you know, most of the world's in poverty. Doesn't take a lot of money to yeah. inspire people to do the right thing. And I then, make, yeah, I was maybe, writing down the notes. What you're Exactly. Yeah. And maybe even give an award yeah. for somebody doing the right thing. Like, hey, our... Our person who who wanted to protect the animals award yeah. in this area, you know, here you go. Yeah. So little things like that. Money does talk in areas of poverty, and that's why 
coaching is so huge is because money talks. Yeah. So, you know, you try to connect the dots of why you want to save these animals. But if somebody's starving and trying to feed their family, they it all it's just, you know what I mean? So yeah. you have to you have to work and help the economic situations like we were doing, you know, covering all areas. So I fully understand and feel exactly what you're saying, where it's overwhelming. Yeah. But there are ways kind of to cut through the clutter. Yeah, no, I love that idea. And I'm, I was making notes when you were saying that. And one of the things that we have done is we have also launched incentives for youth because what these young men who are mostly, I don't know if you know this, but in India, 55% of the population are below the age of 35. Oh. And these young men, they have nothing better to do. Like they, mm -hmm. many of them are jobless. Many of them are not qualified, uneducated, illiterate. So they just don't know what to do with themselves and their time. So they chase elephants. It has become a spectator sport, bullying elephants. And that is something that I managed to obtain exclusive footage of, uh, you know, and one young bull elephant being chased by so many men and the poor thing running for his life. It was just devastating to witness. And then when he went into his forest patch, they're following him inside the forest patch. Yeah. So where will he go? Yeah. Right? But and I and hold, hold that thought right there. Cause two more things, two more things for you to take notes on. Yeah. Um, that you said that I want to share with you with the informer situation um, completely confidential. Like we really keep somebody's comf yeah. you know, uh, identity so top secret because we don't want any, any reaction, negative reaction or, you know, pushback from the community. This is completely confidential and we, we will die before even saying a name. Yeah. So that's very, once they realize you mean it and you will keep it confidential, they will trust you. Yeah. Then you're talking about the young, young people, the young men, yeah. So one of our directors researched the sector and interviewed young men, mm -hmm. asking them had they poached and why why would you poach? Like what are what would make you lead that life? Why would you go into that? Turns out, like you said, nothing to do. Yeah. No no place to go. Poverty, all that stuff. They said if we had some organized sports like soccer, that would be something we'd look forward to and have a place to go every day. Uh -huh. So we started a soccer league. Win win. Everybody's so happy. Yeah. They, the kids now have a place to go after school. They're not, you know, idle, idle, you know, what is it? Um, idle hands is does the devil's work. Workshop. Yeah. Give them something to do. Yeah. So that might be something. Introduce yeah. a football league in India for the locals see how that yeah. works no that's that's i was just coming to say that what we have done is that uh, that's a really another great idea to introduce sports and in india they play cricket so maybe mm -hmm. you can launch a cricket team or something but what i was trying to say is that we have actually zoomed in on a specific area it's a three thousand square kilometer area where you know there's there are so many tea plantation it's a it's a massive landscape filled with tea plantations and very much adjacent to those tea plantations is this incredibly magnificent Gorumara National Park. So obviously people encounter elephants constantly, even uh, leopards. And um, so one of the things we did is that the same youth who would bully elephants, we trained them we got them to wear nice t-shirts and hat and look like they are the elephant ambassadors. And guess what? Because they are aggressive, they know how to manage the aggressive crowd. And so it's working like charm. Wow, and, and, I love that. Yeah, and, I love that. That's and, smart. It is. I think so too. And yeah. in, in that one year that we've been there, just the last year we launched this, there's not been a single elephant or human deaths. And the thing is, there was one human injury, but then humans were not upset because we provided them with resources to heal the family. And some of the basic things like flashlights, we distributed approximately 2,500 flashlights and the families, like we, I think we reached about 7,000 individuals living in that landscape and about 50 villages. And we have about 25 to 30 community leaders. So they're all like, hey, are you using the flashlights? And you know, people say flashlights, 
it is such a simple tool. And but effective. What it, yeah, and effect, incredible, thank you. If incredibly effective because what it does is that is it alerts the elephants of human presence and, and the elephants say, okay, we're not stepping out of this place until these people go. Right. And at the same time, well, humans can spot the elephants and say, okay, we, the elephants are there because, you know, in India, as you said, poverty is rampant and they don't even have toilets inside their homes. So they have to step mm -hmm. out in mm -hmm. the middle of the night. Right. And that's when human elephant conflict occurs. So, yeah, little things like that make a big difference. So these are yeah. some of the things we're doing and we are in, installing like solar fencing, um, elephant friendly solar fencing also and again another thing we did with that as well we trained them and we we told them you can own it you can this is like a portable thing you can remove it off after the um, farming season but they're like no no we're going to keep it throughout the year we will take care of it so That's to me awesome. it's like yeah it's awesome because they're like now they're accountable yeah. and they're saying we know what to do because we are not making them rely on us instead we're it's like they say, what, don't feed a fish, but rather teach them how to fish. Yeah. You know, that kind of an approach is what we are taking. Yeah, from. it's that you hit a very good point. Give them ownership in the yeah. success of their future. If they feel like they're part of it and they're really making a change, it gives them a sense of pride and nobody will work harder for you. So exactly. those are some brilliant strategies right there. Some brilliant strategies. Um, so quick thing, um, I want to play a portion of something you'd sent us from Gods and Shackles because I want to talk about your book and I want to talk about um, Voice for Asian Elephant Society. So um, this is from the trailer and we're going to play a portion for you, which you probably know by heart, Miss Sangeeta, but for our listeners and our viewers, uh, my special guest Sangeeta Iyer, um, she's founded everything she's won everything and she's awesome so let's skip that December and May, there are so many little festivities that take place. All this culminates and lead up to Trishur Puram, in which there are at least 100 elephants participating. I was appalled to see a blind elephant, this majestic, magnificent animal that has so much power, was completely broken in spirit. To me, that was very hurtful. Then the other brutality that I saw was an elephant had injuries in his ankle, and on those injuries, there were shackles. And when I asked the handler how come he had such deep injuries, he tried to justify by saying that they had to chain him tightly because they didn't want him to get out of control. The reality is this elephant was in his peak mating season and that's the time when they generally tend to get dominant and the handlers are then unable to control them. The chains cut deeper and deeper into the ankles and they end up with self-inflicted wounds that can be totally avoided. That is so powerful to me and uh, again, my special guest is saying Gita Iyer. She created this amazing and powerful documentary called Gods, Gods and Shackles. Um, I was really honored to host the event here in San Diego. And I remember what a difficult watch it was. But as I've learned in conservation, if you think it's difficult to watch, imagine being the one going through it. So you suck it up. And do the right thing and know what's going on in the world and and know the pain of others that's the only way you're going to achieve something so again this is a an award-winning movie it's so powerful it's being shown still everywhere around the world and so have things improved in the temple area of of elephants in india right now especially in kerala had things improved and then i want to talk about your book 
Yeah, thank you. So no, uh, they will continue to justify that, uh, you know, they're doing this because it is a cult cultural practice and this has been done traditionally. But I, my argument is, you know, traditionally, 100 years ago, men and women, they would walk, you know, freely, sometimes inside the forest, and they had a different attitude, they had different approach, and they were so attuned with nature, and they took care of the elephants. But now, and at the time, there wasn't, there weren't so many people. Now, population has exploded. We have so many so many advancements technologically we have evolved technologically so why don't you go and entertain yourself in a movie theater or go attend musicals right or you can just play video games at home so don't compare and say what used to be then should be now in that case you should give up everything you have now and go back to where it used to be exactly the way it used to be so don't even start justifying yeah so they continue to do that. And what I have learned is that in recent years, they've also started buying insurance. So insurance companies are basically offering like a monthly premium or whatever. And so they can actually um, insure an elephant that they own. So what happens is when an elephant is ailing, they make comparisons. Okay, if I have to take care of this elephant, it's going to cost me so much in medication. Whereas if I just don't do anything, the elephant will die and I'll get so much in insurance. Yeah. You know, when you start insuring it, you have completely, yeah, you've completely missed the point. You yeah. missed the point. And I'm sorry, if you are abusing, if, if you are using these animals in a religious uh, forum, you know, yeah. under whatever God you have or whatever you pray to, when you are creating such pain and agony in the name of religion, you have lost your mind. You, this is not soul. what you, God wants. You, yeah. He doesn't want you destroying and injuring his, his beloved creations. animal. Thank you. So yeah. you just need to, you need to go get your head checked. Sorry, mm -hmm. all you temple elephant owners. Sorry, I'm saying it. Uh, you need to get a new soul because you are so on the wrong track. You have yeah. missed the boat, people, on on the what the point is and what God wants on the earth. He doesn't want pain and agony, and that is exactly. what you're inflicting. So exactly, and that's like it, it's the ultimate ultimate hypocrisy. Yes, and the paradoxes yes. are just so stark. They worship and defile the same animal. Yes. It's, it's insane. And the thing is, with this Wildlife Protection Act amendment, it is these Kerala lobby groups that were trying to push this thing through so they can perpetuate this torture. What has happened is, since the time I filmed, the, when I filmed it in 2016, there were about close to 700 elephants. Now, mm -hmm. they have less than 500. All the rest have died. Like yeah. 250 have died in four years. It's yeah, just, it's heartbreaking. It's yeah. devastating. And when these animals die, they light candle and they light lamps and they put garland and, and they shed crocodile oh, tears. Oh my God! Seriously? It's, it's yeah, they do. Seriously? Like yeah. uh, you are such a liar. Like you're such a liar in every possible way. You are such a deceitful boy. Exactly. Oh my God! Seriously? Oh, now yeah. we're going to take care of them and garlands yeah. and candles and pray. Really? It's while just, ooze, while the animal's leg was oozing with infection, chained, no yeah. life, underweight, yeah. Yeah. you know, sores, arthritis. Yeah. You didn't care. You didn't care because you're so self-absorbed and so selfish that you didn't think about the agony of this animal. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, I can't go there. I know. <laughs> I know. Even get it's, murdered. Yeah. I don't know. I can do it. Yeah. Seriously. No, it, it's, it's, it's really, it's disgusting. In and every way. Yeah. In every which way. And the thing is they, they, they do this just to kind of, it's like a show thing, a display and it's so ironic that when the elephant is alive, they torture it to death. And when it dies, then they worship it. Like, oh. how can you, like, yeah. I, I mean, you're not even in the right frame of mind to do yeah. things like this. Like you said, you've completely lost your soul. You got to reconnect yeah. with it. And yeah. I don't think that's going to happen in Kerala at this point, at least, because they are into everything that is corrupt. Corruption is... Rampant. 
Yeah, it's rampant. I mean, across India, corruption is rampant, but in Kerala in particular, it's unbelievable because, and I call it even the money that they make is polluted money because yeah. they make money uh, in the Middle East by drilling oil and gas, my, uh, um, you know, gas, whatever, whatever it's called, right? Gas fields, whatever. And that's how they make the money. So they basically are destroying the sea. They're destroying the land and they're extracting these things to pollute the environment. Yeah. And then they bring that polluted money. Then they buy an elephant and they abuse it and they try to make money out of this living being who is so sensitive, who is so emotionally connected and who's so social and depriving them of the basic primordial necessities. It's I call it devil dollars because the devil has his handprint all over those dollars. In yeah. every transaction, the devil is behind that. And I, I fully agree. So let's go to your book. And I, I'm so happy because so, so Gods and Shackles was the documentary. There it is right there. And it is what elephants can teach us about empathy, resilience, and freedom. So take us from... The, the documentary to the book and what is the message that you're sharing in this book? Cause I'm so excited. I'm so proud of you for doing this in your wow. spare time when you're not saving the world, you know, <laughs> I'm going to write a book. Yeah. This is what I'm going to do. So, so I'll tell you what happened right in 2016 of the film was released. I went to a, um, an elephant care center in January, 2017. And I was, feeding a whole bunch of elephants that were shackled. I bought a bunch of fruits. I am their mommy and I brought a whole bunch of fruits for them. And I'm just, you know, puffering up everything and feeding them in their mouth. And I ran into one particular elephant who was quite young and he was just so fed up of humans. He, I can completely understand. He hates humans and I don't blame him at all. But even then, you know, he was trying to be as calm and collected as possible. I fed him and everything. Something happened. His mind just kind of, something happened to him. He just banged his head against mine here. The impact went all the way down to my foot and my foot twisted, became a ball. I had five broken bones. And even to this day, like I wear two titanium plates and 18 screws. So throughout the 2017, I was crippled and I could do nothing. I was tied. I was literally tethered to my sofa. I, I mean, even if I had to go to the toilet, I had to use the walker. Mm -hmm. That was when I wrote the book. And what happened is I have been documenting my whole journey into the making of the documentary. What are the things that transpired? Who are the people that I met? Who are the elephants that I met? What emotions they evoked? How did all of these emotions, how does the suffering of these elephants connect with my own childhood traumas? As a lot of us women, many women have been through what I have been through. You know, I was molested when I was 11 year old child and I, I, I endured um, a very abusive childhood, but I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming my father or anybody. I'm not blaming my mother. I'm just saying that they did the best they could with what they knew. And I just didn't know how to cope with it because the pain was just too severe. So when I watched elephants going through the same kind of suffering and their suffering being justified by culture, similarly how you know, my mother justified the way my father treated me by saying that, you know, this is part of our culture. So there's just so many parallels I began to draw between the lives of the elephants and my own life. But that is just the micro. From the micro, I took it to the macro. And I'm talking about how humans, unable to cope with their own emotional pain and suffering, they're spilling it over into the world and they're hurting other living beings. So the hurting more people hurt people, yeah. hurting people hurt people and yeah. animals. There is a direct connection. And Big if you context. can't fix the problem, yeah. you're going, to, it's going to keep manifesting in different ways and perpetuating. Yeah. 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 And so basically that's what this book is about, right? It's a very deeply personal journey 
But at the same time, there were lots of scenes that I could not include in the film. I could produce only 90 minutes. So with every single elephant, I have spent so much time in the in the chapters. For instance, Lakshmi, the story about Lakshmi, right? It's just, you know, you saw the movie. Yeah. She yeah. is like my soul animal. What they did to her is atrocious. They tethered her next to a bull in his must cycle and they removed his front chains and they forced him to mount her. He mated her. Literally, she was raped. And I was so terrified. And this guy, when I'm talking to him on the phone, the owner, he says, you know what happened today? He thought it was really cool. And he thought that I would I would applaud him. And 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 I said, did, did you just <laughs> did you just tell me that that Lakshmi was raped because of you? And I'm like, I just hung up the phone. And like really? Just, did I just and, hear what I just heard? Like, or did I just imagine this absurd conversation? Like, what did I just hear that I can't unhear? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so that is when this whole my own childhood thing like when i was 11 year old child i was playing in the courtyard with my friends there's this insidious person who lured me into his place he locked the door he stripped himself and luckily luckily like if i think of it now it's just pure luck that i i ran i just kind of dodged him and i op flung open but he he kind of fondled me but i somehow escaped and i you know, flung the door open and I ran into my grandma's arms and I cried for hours. And she said, baby, this is going to be a secret between you and me. So mm -hmm. all these years they've been buried. A secret. And now I'm like, okay, I just have to, this is me too. Move. This is my me too movement uh, moment. And I just have to share with people and with women in particular to let them know you're not alone. And we can all come together. We can all support yeah. each other. And just like how elephants live in such a beautiful matriarchal society, we women can empower each other and support each other and, you know, make this world a better place for yeah. people and animals. It, you know, and, and it can it can be the trauma of a, a, a sexual nature. It could be trauma at work. It could be trauma at home. Yeah. There are a lot of things that the, the, you know, the Me Too movement for women. I mean, I know I was in. I was a radio broadcast broadcaster for thirty five plus years. Um, there was a lot of uh, chauvinism. There was a lot of you know, no girl's going to make what the others. And a lot of things be would be said to you, and you're like, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm in, the, I'm in the room. Um, not did that not register that that was completely inappropriate in every possible way. Um, you see this stuff go on and you see people, like you said, keeping secrets that are killing them, that their insides are dying and, and that this book can be a conduit. It could be something you read that you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. Exactly. I relate to this. Yeah. I understand this pain. Yeah. And I think that's why the elephant is such a cathartic animal, a deep, a, a deep resonating animal in so many ways. And funny you said that because my next podcast next month is a girl named Debbie Ethel of Kota, K-O-T-A, which is Keepers of the Ark. Mm. And the elephant saved her life and wow. she started this foundation. So people around the world resonate and are drawn to elephants. So when you see these magnificent historical animals who have stories to tell they're the keepers of the secrets of the world and the and the earth there's something so soul stirring when you are near an elephant I, i've had i just had an experience in zambia the same way where you just feel like they're reading your entire life story it's the most yeah. amazing yeah. unbelievable feeling and to see an animal being abused and seeing the atrocities that are going on you know, it's it's hard to hear this stuff, but now that you're aware of it for our viewers and our listeners, now that you're aware of it, look around, you yeah. see a problem, yeah, report it, yeah. reach out to Sangeeta, reach out to me. Yeah. We'll put the, the we'll get the ball in motion of trying to create change for you if you don't think you know an avenue of how to treat it. So yeah. I'm sure it was a difficult book for you to write, 
but a very cathartic. Sorry. Oh my God. Seriously. You're probably crying the whole time. Like, ah, I'm, crying. I'm writing a book, but I'm bawling the entire time. Yeah. So it was just released. It was just, yeah. and who's your publisher? Hey house. Hey based, house. In, based in San Diego. What? That's awesome. That's so awesome. So, um, so voice for Asian elephants, we got a few more minutes, Sangeeta, um, the voice for Asian elephant society. Um, give us a couple of the projects you're working on right now. Yeah, so many projects. Actually, over the last two years, we have launched about a dozen projects. One of them was a flashlights project uh -huh. that I talked about, mm -hmm. the, you know, the in, installing the elephant friendly fencing. But one of the projects that I am so excited about, we are just about to launch within the next couple of weeks is mm -hmm. installing sensors near the railway tracks because approximately 186 elephants have gotten killed by the deadly trains right? And so what elephants do is they cut through between forest patches. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a railway track that crosses the forest. So they have to cross, elephants have to migrate and they get hit by the recklessly speeding trains. So we are installing these sensors that would alert elephants. And these sensors are being developed by the indigenous people based in West Bengal, they understand the terrain, they understand the weather patterns. So they're creating, they're very, you know, um, India is technologically very evolved. As you would know, when when this major Y2K happened, a yeah. lot of Indian people came to, uh, you know, the came to, um, what's it called, San Francisco, where, yeah. you know, that it's called the tech, what, I don't know what it's called. Oh, um, Silicon Valley. Exactly. Silicon Valley. Silicon yeah. Valley. So what I was trying to say is that, so yeah, the technology is really robust and it's catered to this particular um, terrain. So we're going to launch that. And once that is done, we are going to then take it to different parts of different states. And so I'm really, really excited about that. We launched this project, Asian Elephants 101 for the youth. We launched a Gentle Giant Summit where we brought together various ministries. So talk, come on, like let's communicate because this is like a, it's not, people are operating in a silo. You can't work that way yeah. because everything yeah. is integrated. We have to be collaborative, like I said earlier, right? So we have done, and we continue to do a whole lot of work. If people are interested, they can go to vfaes.org and mm -hmm. um, take a look at, you know, what we are doing. I just wanted to mention something very quickly about the elephants. You were talking about the things that they conjure up, right? So uh, this is a very short story, but I feel like I need to share this. Share it, because, share it. Because I just think that um, people will be fascinated. You know, they say bull elephants in their must are very dominant and aggressive. When I was filming, this is me alone because I didn't take a camera crew. I, w I did all of the filming because I didn't want to disturb the wildlife. And I took a very, very unassuming, small, of course, a very highly sophisticated camera. And I started filming. I saw this elephant from a distance and he came with this like real majestic walk. He walks towards our truck and then he's like, oh, you guys are here. And he just stood there and he's looking at so my, I should backtrack my driver and the guy there inside. Nobody wants to come out. Yeah. I am alone in the backside of the truck. It's an open truck. And I am just devouring this amazing, magnificent forest and the wildlife. So this guy comes, he's like, oh, what are you doing here in my space? Like, that's the question yeah. I felt from can, this elephant, please. right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, and, and but he paused. He paused and he looked at me. I didn't move. I'm zooming in and out and I'm like, okay, honey, stay there, stay there. Come on, move the side. I'm doing all these things. I got close up shots of his tusks, of his eyes and of him looking at me. And then like, I'm, like, I'm looking good. You want a close up here? How about and, this angle? Uh, and, here, and here's the thing. He, he was in his must, which and is, this guy was in his, it's like, yeah, it's frightening. Yeah. And then he looks at me and he's like, okay, well, I don't think she's going to move. So let me walk back. So he turns around and he walks back and he's like, no, this is my right of way. And he comes back again and he stands there and he's like, come on now, move. And I'm like, please don't do this to us. We can't move because if we reverse the car, he'll be really agitated. all upset. Yeah. And, and we are like, and so I'm, and my driver is like, he's, he's trying to get his gun to kind of scare him. I pinched him so badly. And I said, do not 
do anything to him. He's mine. Yeah. Just stay quiet. And they all stayed quiet. And guess what this animal did, this elephant? He walked down a pathway, came across our truck, came behind, and I'm, my camera is like panning with him. And when he came behind, I'm just shooting. And he's like, this is all I wanted. I just wanted to. I just wanted to pass. I just wanted to pass. <laughs> and he, he kept walking and he's turning around and he's looking at me. And I'm like, oh, my God, I love you. I love you so much. It's my one-on-one -on -one with the big bull. Oh, my God, I love but, that. Uh, what, I, what I was trying to say is they are so intuitive. Yes. I know he heard me. Because throughout course. this process, I'm like, I love you. I love you. Don't come closer. Uh -huh. Don't come closer. I love you. Please stay there. Please, like, do, I don't want you to be hurt. Because these guys, they, they won't yeah. hurt him, but they'll scare him, right, by shooting the rifle in the air. I just didn't want that to happen. But it all ended. And when it was over, the driver and the guy like, ma'am, we've never seen anything like this. I'm like, well, that's what elephants are all about. When you give them the respect they deserve, they will completely return it to you. Exactly. Completely. And They're more. very sophisticated. They're very sophisticated. I love that story. That is a perfect story <laughs> to wind this up. Oh, my God. Sangeeta, I've had the best hour. I'm so glad we got to spend time and reconnect in this crazy COVID world. I know you're so busy. So again, Sangeeta Iyer, she is the founder of Voices for Asian Elephant Society. She is the creator and the documentarian on Gods and Shackles. She's just released a book, Gods and Shackles, What Elephants Can Teach Us About Empathy, Resilience, and Freedom. And this is a go girl. This is somebody who just doesn't just talk about it. She does it. And I am honored to call you a friend. I'm I honored to call you a friend. And I'm so excited that, you know, we had a chance to connect despite a little bit of my grogginess. But it was and when I meet you, it's everything disappears. It's like oh. it's all gone. I mean, oh. I mean, the energy that you bring is fantastic. So oh, thanks, Angita. Totally contagious. Oh. So that's a good kind of contagion. It's good. It's a good thing. That would be a good pandemic to have. Good stuff yes. going on. Absolutely. My love, have a wonderful day. I hope you feel better. Thanks Thank for making you. time for us. And anything, you. any updates you've got, anything you want to announce, please let me know. I'd be Absolutely. happy to get the information out because I think you rock, sister. Uh, thank All you, right. you too. We uh, rock. Uh, yay. Right. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for watching and listening to Coexist. This is Conversation for Conservation, and we are here to change the world. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, and I will see you next month. Another great guest right here on Coexist. Bye, Sangeeta. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>